we, we see, I mean, uh, really, uh, at a certain point, uh, the Ba'ath Party understands, obviously, that it cannot uh, really work only with, with uh, I mean, their own people, uh, and uh, they start to attract also and to draw people back who left already, and among them, they already mentioned Shahistani, and, um, and also Jaffa came back at a certain moment from UK, he, he had left in the meantime. And um, a key priority was to acquire a powerful reactor. And uh, already in the 70s, uh, in the early 70s, and especially in 74, Iraq tries to buy its first very powerful um, reactor from France, and this request is turned down because it's it already it, it stinks a little bit. I mean, people say, "Oh, what what do they need that reactor for?" Uh, and at that time, Israel started also reacting, and they were targeting scientists associated with the Iraqi nuclear program, and also attacking nuclear items. Uh, which were in shipment to Iraq. For example, uh, uh, the reactor core for this newly acquired reactor, when it was still in France, was destroyed by an attack. So uh, one already could see that there was a concern. I mean, um, and also France was concerned at, at a certain, certain stage, uh, proposed to Iraq to change the fuel of the reactor because the fuel was a highly enriched uranium fuel and uh, France uh, proposed that it could be changed to 9% fuel and, and the Iraqi Atomic Energy Commission refused. And in December 79, so already after the Islamic Revolution in Iran, um, the already mentioned scientist Hussein Shahistani uh, was arrested in Iraq on suspicion of being a member of the Shiite religious Dawa party, which he probably was, really. No? So, I mean, uh, Saddam was enormously afraid of a, Islamic, of a Shiite Islamic revolution in Iraq. So, Shahistani was uh, arrested, and Jaffa, who was at that time uh, also, I mean, the director, the director general of the uh, research center, um, he started to protest the incarceration of Shahistani, and he wrote to Saddam and urged him to release Shahistani. I mean, it's a very, <laughs> uh, how can I say, perhaps a little bit naive from his point of view, because uh, the result was that also Jaffa was arrested. I mean, it was not quite the same thing. I mean, Shahistani in, uh, was tortured and uh, I, I mean, uh, Jaffa's condition was completely different. He was in jail for a certain time, but then went to house arrest. No? Um, and in June, and now the story becomes interesting, because in June 1980, uh, each of them received a visitor. Um, and Jaffa was taken to meet Saddam's half-brother, Barzan, who was the director of the intelligence service. And this Barzan told Jaffa that Saddam wanted uh, him to develop nuclear weapons. Huh? So uh, uh, Jaffa answered uh, Barzan that he is not uh, capable, that he doesn't have the necessary knowledge and experience to lead a nuclear weapons program, but at the end he gave in and he agreed he would do it. No? And he was rewarded with a more comfortable house arrest, but he still stayed in house arrest. No? And also Shahistani in jail received a visit um, with the same request, but he refused, and Shahistani then stayed in, in prison until 91. He managed to escape during uh, after the turmoil, during the turmoil after the Gulf War in 91. But then, I mean, we are in June 1980, huh? and then nothing happens. Huh? Absolutely nothing happens, which is very astonishing because, I mean, you would expect if there is the political wish for a program that uh, there are f for, uh, practical steps are following, but there was no establishment of a program. Uh, instead, in September 1980, the Iran-Iraq war started, and obviously, I mean, we have to conclude that Saddam's uh, attention shifted completely to that war. And just there was no, I mean, Jaffa was sitting in house arrest and reading books on, on the nuclear things and 
and nothing happens. But uh, what happened in, in 81 is uh, that Israel attacked and destroyed the French provided uh, nuclear reactor Oziraq in Iraq, I mean, in Tuwaitha in 81. So, and uh, this was the point where the uh, Iraqi scientific uh, community really was outraged. I mean, uh, um, another author, Jacques Hyman's, um, who wrote also a book not only about the Iraqi pro uh, program, but uh, several other programs, he uh, wrote this was the finest time for the Iraqi nuclear program because everybody, everybody, even who hated Ba'athists, wanted to work in that program because they were so outraged by, by the Israeli attack. So it's really very interesting because we really can say this Israeli attack might have been a military success, but it was for sure a strategic Blunder. Uh, what's interesting is uh, that uh, the Iraq nuclear program then, I mean, in 81, then Jaffa proposed to Saddam also a path uh, to, um, to uh, uranium enrichment, um, while uh, the, the, the fear that uh, Iraq could use the reactor, of course, was not the uranium path to a bomb, but plutonium. So Iraq started to embark uranium enrichment, and um, and uh, but again it was quite surprising to see that the political leadership did not um, um, pressure the scientists to proceed quickly. Or so it was really a, how can I say a scientists program, no? And uh, they had uh, they moved like they had all the time in the world. It, it emerged as a program led by scientists. And uh, this star, um, um, with Saddam Hussein's uh, former uh, bodyguard, his cousin and, la and later son-in-law, um, took charge of the program. So um, um, Jaffa, they tried different paths of uranium enrichment. I want to know, uh, don't want to bore you with, uh, with too much technical information, but it's also very interesting that Jaffa really more or less technically tried to improve the techniques of the Manhattan program. You know, the Manhattan program which produced the first atomic uh, bomb for, uh, of the United States. No? And he, for years, researched on, on something which then did not yield results. By the way, he was, uh, until today, he's criticized by other Iraqi nuclear scientists, uh, some even say he exercised some kind of procrastination. Uh, what's sure is that this program was quite dysfunctional and did not uh, bring very good results. For, for example, the aim of the program was 15 kilograms of 93% uh, enriched, high enriched uh, uranium per, per year. And at the end of the whole period in 91, there was about 600 grams. So, I mean, so you see it was not very good. Also, other paths failed. Also, the gas centrifuges program, which was started only in, in 87, did not uh, bring uh, bigger results. But we should not, I mean, um, they would have done it. I mean, they would have succeeded. It's not easy to say when. There are different estimations by, but uh, the, the estimate of the agency is that by, um, by 94, 95, they would have had enough material for a bomb. No? Um, what's interesting is that Jaffa's um, path of enrichment, enrichment, it was really a very strange story, but uh, it had one advantage. Um, it could be done almost without um, procurement from outside. So this is one of the reasons why the, the program was not detected for a very long time. And it's also interesting to see, I mean, Israel in 81 uh, bombed that reactor and then went to sleep. I mean, they did not care anymore. Um, so this program really was detected only in, 90, in 91, 10 years later. No? Uh, while the uranium centrifuge um, um, enrichment program, which was stated later, was not possible without procurement, as also the Iranian uh, is not, was not, also, you know, also Iran bought its first uh, centrifuges from outside. No? 
So um, there was also work on weaponization aspects after 86, 87, and there was one thing which is called the crash program. The crash program of 91, and um, you have to remember that in August 1990, um, Saddam invaded Kuwait, and at that time they decided to, uh, to divert uh, the agency safeguarded uh, reactor fuel they had in the country and wanted to re-enrich uh, it, I mean it was already uh, high enriched uranium, to re-enrich it to, to make a, a very quick path to the bomb. But they would not have done it technically. I mean uh, the, the agency's uh, assessment all, always was that more or less the Iraqi scientists were saved by the Gulf War of 1991 because uh, they would not have, uh, I mean, just achieved it. They would have had uh, to admit it that they no, are not able technically. So um, the Gulf War in 91 ended everything. And um, as you perhaps know, it was ended um, politically by a ki kind of, yes, uh, ceasefire. Um, yeah, resolution, resolution 68, UN Security Council resolution 687 of April 1991, which ordered the complete disarmament of Iraq. Um, and, I mean, really, not only it ordered the disarmament, but it was clear that the, Iraq, uh, that the United States really wanted to change the status quo of the region. I mean, they really succeeded with this resolution to put Iraq in a box. I mean, with the harshest sanctions ever which in history, and uh, also we should not forget the terrible toll on, on Iraqi society. No? Uh, consequences up to the day. I mean, many things which we are seeing now were really started during these sanctions years in the, in the 1990s, the Iraqi middle class practically being wiped out. And, uh, we should say that uh, critics of the IAEA, of course, tend to overlook uh, that at that time there were huge inspections restrictions. I mean, at that time, I, uh, the agency safeguards really were designed to confirm that the country was using it de declared fissile material uh, and sites as claimed and nothing more. I mean, you had four sites and th those four sites were controlled in Iraq and nothing else. I mean, it was not uh, permitted even to the inspectors to say, okay, what's this building? I want to see this building. I mean, it was, just was not possible. No? But um, as I said, the United States, uh, most of the drafters of the resolution wanted to, to keep the agency out, but finally they compromised also because there were doubts if it's a good idea to weaken the agencies uh, substantially. And, but they built into the uh, resolution some insurance uh, that uh, their points of concern would be dealt with. And as part of the compromise, uh, compromise uh, the Iraqi file was, uh, for example, assigned not to the IAEA, but to the uh, director general of the IAEA. I mean, really the person, of course, with the aim to keep out the multinational board of governors, no? and really to attach it only to, to him. And even more serious, uh, the task had to be carried out with the, quote, assistance and cooperation of ANSCOM. ANSCOM was uh, the UN Special Commission which, wa uh, which was created uh, only for the purpose of, of uh, inspecting Iraq uh, and for the purpose of um, for the dossiers of uh, biological and chemical files and um, weapons and, and missiles. No? So um, in, a, in a way the IEA was uh, controlled by this ANSCOM and uh, for example also ANSCOM had the power to to um, designate uh, sites. I mean, ANSCOM could say, okay, uh, there is a site we, we are suspicious of, you have to go and con inspect it. No? And uh, this, of course, was really uh, a source of conflict between, between the IAA and the ANSCOM for the years to, to come. 
And uh, this part uh, of my research was quite astonishing. I mean, uh, it was much stronger than I expected, I have to say. No? Um, um, it, there, especially in the first years, it was, it was really very, very pro problematic. Um, uh, also, from the ANSCOM per perspective, um, if, if during the first uh, years, uh, they claimed that uh, the agency lacked uh, the necessary toughness, I mean, the inspectors. There was really, I mean, th these uh, groups of inspectors really called each other names, you have to ima imagine. I mean, for example, the IEA inspectors, inspectors were called the bunny huggers. Huh? And the ANSCOM inspectors were the tough guys. I mean, they're really, you know, the cowboys and so on. And uh, the IEA, for its part, I mean, the IEA inspectors uh, complained that uh, ANSCOM does not have, you know, professionalism and, and lack of technical and structural and know-how and so on and so on. And it's true. I mean, this is a very in in interesting story. It's really true that I think the agency inspectors sometimes had it to learn the hard way, I mean, to develop a completely new inspection culture, no? Inspection culture which, which is not built on the confidence that the country you inspect is cooperating with you automatically, no? So that uh, sometimes you have to inspect against the will of a country, you know? And of course, in Iraq, they had a, uh, the in most intrusive, uh, intrusive mandate you can imagine, I mean, uh, practically they could do everything there, I mean, which is not the case in, in, in other, other countries. By 96, uh, the agency knew quite a lot about the Iraqi problem, <coughs> program, and in 97, it uh, issued a comprehensive report, uh, which really left, uh, I had only a few questions open, and, and this report more or less is valid until today. You can read it also in the internet. It's a very interesting report of, I think, 80, 90 pages. Um, and, uh, I mean, the, we have to say that the success was twofold, because, uh, first of all, it really dissected and dismantled this program, but also it verified the continuing absence of a new program. No? So uh, the question is, why was it, it this not acknowledged, no? for the sake of the agency, of course, but also for the sake of Iraq? I mean, also for Iraq at the time, it would have been important to see the famous light of the end, at the end of the tunnel. No? Uh, and the 97 report uh, concluded that only minor issues in the nuclear sector remained to be resolved. And the logical conclusion would have been the formal termination of the disarmament phase. I mean, it was concluded. Disarmament uh, was concluded. And uh, the, 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 uh, the program for the future would have been uh, um, mostly ongoing, mon ongoing monitoring and verification, OMV it was called. No? Um, however, there were huge political pressures on the agency in 97, not to say this, not to close uh, the nuclear file. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting because intelligence information played already an important role in the American application of pressure. Every time the agency said, uh, we, f uh, we fully understand this or that chapter of the Iraqi nuclear program, promptly delivered intelligence would, would turn up and allow the Americans to object and say, no, you don't understand. No? And of course, automatically also political pressure was uh, put on US intelligence agency to provide policymakers with the evidence they needed and they wanted. No? So, and this is exactly how the generation of flawed intelligence, uh, which uh, then was used in 2002 and 2003, um, uh, started. Uh, of course, this happened also because the consensus in the UN Security Council how to proceed with Iraq had uh, uh, completely evaporated and much earlier, I mean, with the Balkan Wars. I mean, 90 was a special moment, 1991. Uh, you know, the demise of the Soviet Union and, uh, and uh, the, uh, I mean, the uh, Soviet uh, Union, uh, the Russians, which support a uh, resolution to make war against Iraq. I mean, it would have been unthinkable a few years earlier. No? 
So um, the majority view in the Security Council was that the termination of the disarmament issue should be followed by the termination of sanctions against Iraq. And, and therefore, it was essential for the United States to demonstrate that Iraq has not made major progress in closing uh, even uh, nuclear file or also other f files. But, uh, but this, again, confirmed Iraqi impressions in 97 and 98 that regardless of their level of cooperation, the sanctions would not be lifted. No? And so when in December 98, inspectors had to leave Iraq in the face of an imminent uh, US and UK military strike, um, Iraq, Saddam Hussein did not allow them back. And, but this absence of inspectors in Iraq after 98 resulted exactly in a situation where, uh, this is a quote of, of, uh, of an inspector and, and head of Iraq action, uh, Iraq action team, also in 2003, Jacques Bott, he said, um, every possible speculation, including the most pessimistic interpretation of fuzzy intelligence or worst case scenarios extrapolated from procurement attempts was taken at face value. Uh, and this is exactly what happened, what happened in 2003. And I leave it here.